Hey, good morning, Matthäus. Uh, super big thanks uh, to, to make it possible that we have a conversation today. I, before we actually start to talk, I would like to show something which was created by my, my dear colleague Adam Kopisch. Um, I'm not an expert in Polish, but as far as I understand, the slogan says, where's farmers, there's fruits. And I, I like that a lot. I like that slogan a lot because it's very important that everybody talks about agriculture, but we cannot forget about the farmers. So that's my big pleasure today that you are here with us today uh, because you are one of the farmers. I have never seen actually a farmer like you who has been so active on the farm, changing things, but then also trying to spread the word, trying to engage on all kinds of levels, political levels. It seems like you are really a global citizen trying to drive these change topics of agriculture, even on, on, on global platforms quite a lot. So with this, my first question to you, um, uh, Matthäus, is having all those activities in your portfolio, what's your plan for this week? And how do you manage all these things at the same time? Which I can hardly believe it's possible. Yeah, thank you, Klaus. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, looking forward to our exchange and um, and yeah, I should now I've realized I should be wearing the T-shirt uh, on me right now. It's in my it's in my closet. I know you have one. Yes. Yeah, I have I have have a few actually. Um, so and I like it a lot. Like not only the slogan, but it's also nice material and and I guess sustainable and so on. My plan for this week it's um, fairly relatively quiet. And what I mean by that is. Uh, for the two days of this week, I will be on the road meeting with people, which is uh, kind of a new, I mean, not new reality, but like I haven't been doing that for like month, uh, sorry, a year and a half uh, due to COVID. So very much looking forward to those face to face meetings and like taking some relationships forward. Uh, and other than that, it will be, of course, many Zoom meetings like that in like one on one calls, one to many calls, uh, a lot of working groups uh, because the UN Food System Summit pre summit is getting close, right? So like a lot of coordination with that. Um, yeah, so a lot of those calls and then hopefully in between some work uh, on documents that need to be taken forward. And last but not least, I do hope to be driving a tractor this week as well uh, as we are finishing off the first cut of hay here on, on the farm in northern Poland. Uh, but for the time being, the weather is not supportive uh, for us to continue the work. So, so I'm able to to talk with you right now and not being a, in a tractor. So good for me, but but not good for not good for your farm actually that the weather is that bad at the moment. But yes, if we take a couple of steps back, you you are one of those farmers trying to really change agriculture, going into regenerative ways, uh, going into. Um, creating new value for farmers uh, in the area of carbon, for example, we can see the European Carbon Farmers logo on your back. Um, if you go back, how did you, how did it start? What made you make drive all these changes? But what was the initial starting point to make those changes? Yeah, so thank you for the question. I think like I can take the question at two different levels, right? Like one is the farm uh, and farm level and changes happening on the farm and then then uh, then like question number two that I'm hearing is like what about me personally right and then then the two are very much connected of course so when it comes to the farm what has been driving us since I can remember and what is driving us right now is uh, a desire to make money in sustainable or uh, risk um, like yeah, make money in, in a way in which we are not only making money, but also managing risk and then environmental risks connected with climate change are very much part of that risk assessment, even though we are probably not conducting, you know, risk assessment to the extent large multinational would or large investment fund would. Mm -hmm. Uh, having that said, you know, we, we, we feel and see with our own hands and eyes the impacts of climate change. Um, on the farm, right? So, so this ability to uh, be running a wonderful farm, which is making money, contributing to the bottom line, the environment, the society, uh, what w was and is what has been driving us since. And then, of course, you had different levers that enabled us to to change and transition, right? Uh, the biggest uh, of which, in our case, um, in this reality that we are in right now. Uh, 
the reality of Poland entering the EU and so on, is uh, common agriculture policy of the EU, right? So in 2004, that enabled us to uh, not only rethink the way we, we do farming, but also uh, provided us with tools to change that. And then looking back, you know, we can see that we've been transitioning from conventional to sustainable and then regenerative agriculture. Uh, but back at the time when we've been making those changes, we didn't know uh, this is what we are doing. Like, like we didn't know the fancy words. We, we've we been describing that in very much a more, uh, yeah, much more simpler language, which was, hey, like we are here and that situation towards which we are transitioning is simply better. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's do that. And now, now we know the fancy language, right? And then my personal answer is, as I said, very much connected with the farm story. Uh, I've been born on this farm. I've been looking as it as it grows and it, uh, as it develops. And also at some point, roughly at the age of 16, I got invited to be actively contributing to the farm, thanks to the knowledge of English, basically, uh, which provided better incentive or opportunities for this farm to, to grow and, and be more profitable and, and uh, less risky, basically. Um, and that continued, right? So like the, 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 the farm activity is really at the core of what I do at any level you can choose and pick. Uh, having that said, which probably will be getting more into this discussion today, um, everything is systemic and uh, unfortunately, I feel like saying everything is very political in that space, uh, also in the energy sector, right? That's why if you want to have an impact into, yeah, like 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 doing something better, yes, like having having a wonderful farm is is good, and like that can be good enough, fair enough. But like, if you want to change the system, you have to be approaching it from the systemic perspective and from yes. comprehensive regulatory perspective. This is why I'm engaging at those levels, right? Because I do want to have that impact. Not I do want to have that impact, but I do want to see certain changes happen uh, and realistic way of making that happen to any degree is by engaging with those systems, right? Mm -hmm. uh, allow me the question. Um, is that also, I mean, change agents always face resistance that that comes natural. So do you face a lot of pushback in the pharma community because you want them to do the things that it's also a generation conflict that you want them to do things differently? Not at all. Uh, and I'm actually reflecting on that question. I, I'm certainly participating in different conflict situations, but I'm seeing more collaboration, open mindedness, and yeah, ability to like work with each other at different levels and different stakeholder groups, then uh, let's say I would I could have been expecting a year ago, right? Mm. Uh, and and let's you know let us put that in some kind of frame. And the frame is super simple uh, and super like yeah super clear from my perspective at least, which is you know as a as a globe. We want to get to net zero by 2050 at the very latest, but also we want to get there in a way that is nature positive, let's say from farming and ecosystem services, or maybe ideally, yeah, regenerative, na nature positive, same stuff, you know, no longer sustainable, no longer like we are good enough, but we are mm -hmm. on the plus side of sustainability, therefore regenerative. Uh, but also deliver on the SDGs and many other, you know, like wishes and desires that we that we might have, right? That's why we, from my perspective, we are not only talking about Paris Agreement, but we are also talking about farm to fork strategy, biodiversity strategy in the in the European Union context, and many other great strategies from from different parts of the world, which are not directly applicable to me in Poland, but are very much aligned with this global. Uh, push towards, let's say, regeneration, right? Um, yeah, and then your question was specifically about the farmers, right? And 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 when you explain to the farmers, like this, let's say, big picture, um, they get it, like, that is that clear. And even if they don't get it, they, because nobody explained that to them, which is the role of the governments and the extension, services which mm. in some countries are like not to the to the level they they could be and should be 
Um, so even if that comprehensive, let's say, understanding is not there, there is a first-hand feel and understanding that that like, hey, I have an opportunity and a challenge in front of me, right? Mm -hmm. Because regulation is getting tighter, because we have all those very ambitious goals that are coming coming quite soon, and very few people are actually able to tell me like, hey, how is my farm looking in that reality, right? So when you have even a a bit of that answer, as we think we have with European carbon farmers and with other initiatives that I am part of, uh, uh, the, the openness is there, right? Cool. Uh, it's, it's as simple as that, because the need is there, right? We, so we need to change. There's, there's an insight that there's a need because there's political pressure, public pressure, regulatory pressure, everybody feels, even there's climate pressure, which you would say you, you feel every every summer. But then you also say what is now really helping a lot is that this is also, we are in the beginning of an opportunity evolving. And and, and this is where I think you are one of the leaders of that European Carbon Farmers um, uh, Initiative, which is opening a new door. Can you explain a little bit where you see the cons, where you have defined the concept of European Carbon Farmers and where the value creation mechanism lies? Yes. Um... Let me try, or I should, right? It's my business. Yes. I should have a very good pitch there. And the pitch is the following, right? Um, in very narrow-minded sense, um, farmers can get paid for carbon that they are either, yeah, for carbon they are capturing and storing in additional and permanent way within the ecosystem uh, yeah, within the ecosystem, be it soil carbon or woody biomass or some other carbon things like peatlands. Or they could also be getting paid for emission reductions, right? And then we would be using carbon in a broader sense of greenhouse gas emissions and greenhouse gas fluxes, uh, mainly methane and nitrous oxide, which are the biggest sources of emissions coming from agriculture and then the CO2 being what we can draw, right? Uh, we are not that big of a of of a CO2 emitter, and then we are talking about specific monetization opportunity, right? And 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 that's a reductionist approach to this conversation, which I would like to see from a much bigger perspective. And and the the, the bigger perspective is the following: we are part of the ecosystem, as Das Gupta Review tells us, published earlier this year, and. Farmers are one of the key stewards of the of the ecosystem as such and of specific ecosystems they are part of, right? It be it in Poland, in Germany, in Brazil, in the US, in Australia, whatever. So we are we are stewards of the ecosystems, right? We are not managers. I don't like to see us as managers of the ecosystems. I don't like to see us as the owners of the ecosystems. I want to see us as stewards of the ecosystems. Each ecosystem has uh, uh cycles cycles of nature in that system right those cycles are carbon energy biodiversity water cycle many others arguably carbon being the most important one of those cycles right because it gives lives to all those other cycles with water being equally important and a kind of biodiversity cycle and energy cycle being derivative of those two other cycles so whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, you are steward of the ecosystem and those cycles, right? The question is, are you, what kind of steward are you? Are you good? Are you so-so or are you bad, right? And in, unfortunately, many cases, because we don't know uh, and we optimize for what we can measure, which is in agriculture, your yield and sometimes your profitability, uh, that has negative consequences of the on the cycles that we are supposed to be stewarding, right? And therefore, both knowledge, awareness, and very importantly, tools for measurements on how you are doing on those other cycles are important. And then maybe one day we will be talking about well-developed markets for those ecosystem services payments. Uh, but where I see the conversation being right now is this beginning stage of awareness connected with the tools. We talked already about the awareness, right? Like the awareness is there. there. But, but the tools are 
are starting to be there. Cool Farm Tool being one example of, of such tool. Um, but, but we are once again at the beginning stages of, uh, of, of this whole conversation. And then if I may say one last thing and then I, I stop talking so that we can continue with wherever you want, Klaus. Uh, kind of back to carbon payments as such, um, my view on that market is that we need a very strategic conversation on the design of the future cap, common agriculture policy of the EU, and agriculture carbon credits or carbon payments, right? Because right now I'm seeing the conversation really not happening together, like really being disconnected. Like you have people talking about carbon payments and you have people talking about cap. Mm. And from my perspective, if we do it like that, we lose both. Uh, we'll kill the agriculture carbon credits market and cap with the public money that it's spending will not be, you know, delivering on the social and environmental goals that it could be delivering on and it should be delivering on from the perspective of the of the EU citizens who are paying for it. Um, and, and bringing that conversation into one is what's, from my perspective, the most critical thing that needs to happen right now. And this is precisely what we are working on as European carbon farmers when it comes to the political dimension of, of those two markets, right? So, I mean, this, this actually what you say gives a clear agenda for the next five to 10 years. Priority one at this point of time is, is capturing on the opportunities in the carbon space because the awareness is there, the money is there, the demand for carbon credits is there, and the farmers have that opportunity. While the methodologies are not yet perfectly developed, we all have to, to, to acknowledge. And while the political alignment with the opportunities for the farmers are also not perfectly connected. But then I was really interested to hear from you that you already think beyond carbon into the broader regenerative space and say there's all these other cycles connected. Biodiversity, everybody talks about it. Nobody knows how to measure biodiversity because it's such a multidimensional target compared to carbon. Water, other soil has all the other topics, you named it. So you think that when we are when we get the carbon under control, when we have a stable system running on carbon capture, on carbon value creation for farmers, the next step would be, and I really hope that's true, that we expand it to an ecosystem payment. Do you think there will be the same financial demand for such type of credits in the future? Great questions. Uh, to be honest, we, we don't know uh, because, you know, those markets don't exist. And I think we will have. I mean, it's kind of a reciprocal relationship, right? Because. We can use carbon credits only to, let's say. Fill in the, the leakages to accounting wise to get to net zero by whatever the data is, right? Which is good but maybe not good enough right maybe we need to be rethinking our taxation relationships um and therefore the design of different subsidies including agricultural subsidies so that we get to you know the economy which which measures values rewards um thriving ecosystems Mm. Uh, and, and whether that reward mechanism is taking part through uh, a, a market, which is tradable with different players, or through some kind of uh, yeah, non-market mechanisms like either taxes or, 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 or subsidies, is a, like a question that will be derived from this bigger conversation that I think we need to have. And to some extent, to small extent, we, we are having, right? And I've already referenced as Gupta Review, which contributed tremendously to that. Um, but once again, we are only at the beginning stages of the conversation. What I don't want to be putting my economist hat on, but like what economist theory is, is telling us that is, is that when you have a market that is not yet there, it's only starting, then creating a, a market understood as an exchange is not mm. economically the most efficient way, right? Like, mm. like taxing or subsidies are more economically efficient ways of, of, of initiating the market and maybe then it will transition to a liquid market with multiple players in it. And I would like to 
just one thing kind of coming back to the to the past you know i i the way i see agriculture carbon markets right now is i don't think we are ready for actually having a fully flown conversation about this market is up and running let's get it right and then we'll move to other ecosystem services i feel we need to have this bigger conversation first yeah from which we may get into carbon mm. um, and in particular the relationship not only about the market side of things which will be once again from my perspective a derivative of the bigger conversation but a conversation about how do we design our relationship between the consumers uh the producers the regulator and then the ecosystem um and and then maybe and quite likely agricultural carbon credits will be paying big part in that new design but it has to be strategically designed right it cannot be simply oh like there's a company that wants to offset emissions and therefore we are sourcing those carbon credits from the farmers and we put the price of i don't know 30 euros per ton of co2e it's nice and rosy no it's not right because at the core of it uh, the cap has to change from action based to result based payments right okay. and and politically speaking and also i mean technically speaking to less extent but still work needs to be done this is a huge feast right um yeah and like technically speaking it's probably doable within a year politically speaking it's five to seven as you've said and we if we are ambitious right I think this is super great advice and watch outs. And if there would be anybody who has doubts that Matthäus knows politics, I think after this conversation, <laughs> the doubts are closed. I, I have a question coming back more to the technical lens, because if, if you look at today and how you want to design the European Carbon Farmers Initiative, what, what are the tools that you want to be adopted on the farm? Are those more tools which are related to adopting certain practices or are there gaps and open and open doors for innovation and of course now i'm asking as a as a buyer uh, person do you see there is innovation space which will support the carbon farming in the future there is plenty uh, of innovation uh, spaces pockets opportunities in that space right and of course those opportunities are like conditioned and also influenced by what the carbon prices are and therefore how accurate we want to be and what are the sequestration rates we want to be achieving assuming we are getting rewarded for that right so like you get all the way you know into microbes and like different uh, biological solutions to really be driving sequestration rates in your soil but broadly speaking at least in the polish context where we are in terms of carbon farming is that we are back to basics, right? And I would like yeah. to see two major practices implemented simultaneously uh, on at, at the level of average Polish farm. That is minimization of tillage uh, with stopping plowing uh, and ideally minimum tillage uh, or like zero tillage with keeping the soil cover 365 days a year or for as long of the year as possible given the, the, the climatic conditions with leaving root in, root in that soil, right? So practice number one prevents you from like, uh, yeah, by, by like your actions leaching carbon that you have stored in your soil back into the atmosphere. And practice number two sequesters more carbon, like continues that cycle and um maintains uh, basically the soil health uh, and maintains that carbon pool that you have in your soil already and that brings me to the tools you've mentioned as mentioned earlier we european carbon farmers uh, just like bayer we are part of uh, the cool farm alliance which has created governs develops and and so on the cool farm tool which if you don't know a dear farmer like please check it out um, um yeah which is basically a tool for uh, estimating your uh, emission um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, of of a of a farm and then of course you can play with different scenarios in there to see what your possible new carbon footprint could be right 
uh, that tool is not there to monetize carbon like some people some companies that are part of uh, of the alliance are actually using that for monetizing agricultural carbon credits but it's like a a rough benchmarking tool to knowing where you are right and and this precisely kind of fits into our way of understanding where an average polish farmer is which is hey i might know that i have some emissions but i don't know what they are i don't know what the level sure. is right yeah and then it's about like just basic knowledge it's really yeah it's really funny because on one hand we are talking about those sophisticated markets with you know the word being perfect and on one and and at the same time we don't know where we are in terms of emissions right um yeah i mean you 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 have been traveling quite quite a bit also leaving europe you have been observing how how farmers are doing in in other geographies of the world was there anything that you could learn from uh, let's say a farmer in brazil are there things which you can take from from those places and of course i mentioned brazil because we have been making a few trial visits together there so anything where you would say your pins are, are really well ahead in terms of maybe thinking but there's always something you can learn wherever you go 100 percent uh and like we could be bringing i don't know us we already alluded to that right but brazil is in in similar category uh when it comes to no till right uh of course climatic conditions differ uh for for brazil and poland but when it comes to no till certainly something to learn there from and that we've been talking about that before right like when it comes to the current design of the of the agricultural carbon credit, the principle of additionality and permanence, we are quite lucky to be plowing right now because we can claim additionality from switching to non-till, which is completely mad. But like that's you know one of those conversations to be had. Um, but then zooming out a little bit and, and thinking once again on Brazil, what I think we could be learning a, a lot from the Brazilians is uh protection of the environment understood as leaving certain percentage of your uh, ecosystem basically in terms of the area uh, in as the forest code in brazil calls it um, natural state i believe that's the term right depending on the biome you know yeah. that um like you have different percentage that you have to leave between 15 if i remember correctly and 80 percent right and like in the in the European context, we have the conversation about leaving, you know, three and five percent of, of of area for like natural habitats, right? Which are very low percentages, and let's make the most out of that, right? Because I'm sure every single farm there is has a certain part of it that is really not productive, right? And it would do very well not only for you for the environment but also for your bottom line to set it aside and you know and 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 let the environment benefit from it right and enhance your cycles of nature but once again you shouldn't be looking at this as like oh i have to that because do that because otherwise my subsidies will not be granted or they will yeah. be taken away but like i have a an, an ecosystem that i am stewarding and therefore um let's take this ecosystem to the next level um so yeah um that's what i would learn from the, from the brazilians i i think you should have the last words you are, you are really looking ahead you are looking forward into into the future from an economic perspective from a political perspective you can you can connect those thoughts can you also help us a little bit maybe as a as a as your closing remark your wish to the industry um you you work with us um you you see the products we have uh what what are what are the things we need to do differently in the future what are the products we need to focus more on or less do you have any recommendations for us Matthias would be super helpful and it will be directly uh fed into into our organization yes and no i mean uh, that's like a consulting assignment in itself and now i'm a consultant kind of so i think <laughs> what to say <laughs> exactly. to sell my sell service but but anyway no like my, my big maybe talking with the farmers or like assuming you know the, the last words are to the farmer think uh, as farmers are think strategically about you know generations ahead mm -hmm. um and then 
in particular this you know very catchy phrase what would net zero mean right like if we are seriously in a net zero world by 2050 what does that mean it probably means our diet broadly speaking is completely different in some places we are eating and producing more meat in some other places basically the whole of europe we are producing much less meat uh, and that has ripple consequences right so okay what would it what would that future look like and therefore how that is impacting my farm and what's the pathway to to get there right because we have 29 years that's a lot and that's not that much uh, at the same time um and then for commercial companies you know same story like okay that's the reality how is this company looking in those 29 years and ideally you know every single year till then right because it's not only about this magical moment uh, because the world the world will not end in 2050 we have to get there uh, in a way which allows us to, to thrive and hopefully we'll be living long after that in a way in which we and the environment is thriving right um and then to very big agricultural value chain players my question would be like hey what's your view on the value chain um yeah value chain concentration division of um income and profits and so on right because like those are being challenged for good and bad reasons, but they are being challenged and uh, and that trend is likely to continue, right? So that would be my kind of personal advice to some of the big value chain players. Hey, big thanks, uh, Matthias. I think these were really impactful insights, I have to say, and it was going really deep in the in the agronomic, maybe not even deep enough, but also in the political in the political dimension. Um, super helpful for us. I wish you best of luck and success for all your endeavors. And I truly hope we can stay in touch um, and I can make any type of contribution that that um, this is going all well in the direction which you which you wish. Uh, with this big thanks and good luck for the year and the harvest. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, and as you started at the beginning, thank you to the farmers because they are already the people, right? The most important, and I am super, super privileged and grateful to be part of that group. Uh, so thank you, farmers, and thank you for the for the exchange. Thank you.